Today, I'm joining a couple of newlyweds on their journey to find a forever home for the whole family. See the potential there. Yeah, I can see that yeah. suiting your parents. Perfectly self-contained. Yes. Yeah. We don't have to yeah. see them when we don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> After putting our property finding skills to the test, it looks like they're ready to put down roots. Where would the Christmas tree go? That side or that side? <laughs> oh, that means you've moved in when you make that decision. That's great. Today we're on Exmoor and I am on the Coleridge Way, which is a 50-mile walking trail that traces the steps of the romantic poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who used to live in Nether Stowey, not far from here, for about three years, right at the end of the 18th century. He would spend days exploring this wild and beautiful countryside, and it was during that time that he wrote his two masterpieces, Kubla Khan and The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And even after 200 plus years, it's still pretty inspiring. Exmoor National Park sits on the north coast of Devon and Somerset, stretching across the two counties. It covers almost 270 square miles and is made up of huge expanses of open moorland, deep wooded valleys and dramatic coastline, including the highest sea cliffs in England. This beautiful landscape has also inspired the work of poet William Wordsworth and R.D. Blackmore, whose novel Lorna Doon was based on local legends. The picturesque hamlet of Momsmead marks the entrance to the Doon Valley, and the view of its Grade II listed Pack Horse Bridge is one of the most photographed in Exmoor. This national park is home to diverse wildlife, but is also a living and working landscape scattered with towns and villages. Two of the most popular are the Devon coastal village of Lynmouth and the town of Linton, perched 500 feet up on a cliff. The twin resorts, nicknamed Little Switzerland, are connected by a water-powered cliff railway, enabling visitors to enjoy a boat ride in the harbour below before gliding up the cliffside to take in the spectacular views of Exmoor and its coastline. The lion's share of Exmoor National Park sits within the county of Somerset, and here you'd spend on average around £319,000 for a detached house, which is pretty much on a par with the national figure. However, things change pretty radically if you want to buy inside the National Park itself. Here, estate agents estimate a 10 to 20% surcharge to get a nice rural property inside the park, but if you want a rural property inside the park, near the coast, then that figure shoots up to 50%. So let's meet today's buyers and find out where they want to live in this beautiful, but surprisingly expensive corner of England. Newlyweds Matt and Daisy met six years ago at their local cricket club. They bought their first home together two years ago, a terraced cottage in North Marston, Buckinghamshire. It was a perfect first house but we do have a lot of stuff. We both have quite a few hobbies and that those generally come with bits and bobs and the dog, so she comes with quite a lot of Pops. stuff. <laughs> Whilst we do love being in the village and having people close by, having neighbours, having a pub just four doors down, we like being away from it all. We like uh, the fact that we can escape. Until recently, Matt's job as a quantity surveyor has tied him to a London commute, but a new role has offered him the flexibility to work from home. And with Daisy about to complete her master's degree in zoology and wildlife conservation, it's the perfect time to make the change. We're particularly drawn to Exmoor, a couple of reasons. Um, Daisy's family uh, are all from there and still live in that area. We go down there quite often. We absolutely love the area. It's uh, the stunning scenery, the activities you can do down there. And we go out for long walks with the dog and we don't have to worry about putting her on the lead because we can just let her run free in the fields. <laughs> With a countryside move on the cards, it's prompted them to think about the future. I'd really like to get maybe a job with the National Park or maybe one of the um, wildlife trusts down in Devon or Somerset. We want a different lifestyle. We want to have some land where we can keep some, hopefully, horses, some sheep. I really want to get back into riding again. We'd also like to get chickens straight away. So I've got to have your eggs. <laughs> Along with Dog Bramble, a horse and the chickens, there are two other family members that need to be factored into the move. We are in a fortunate position where my parents are looking to downsize. They're looking to travel um, the world a bit more to see both my brothers who live in different countries. So we've made a decision as a family that they would come in with us on this move with the intention of having a separate annex or cottage, if possible, on the property. 
Matt's dad has experience in the construction industry, and Daisy and Matt are happy to get stuck in too, which could come in very useful on the search for their forever home. When we moved into this house, uh, the garden was um, pretty much just a flat piece of rubble area. So with the help of my parents, we've redesigned the garden. We've brought about seven tons of soil in to level it off. Daisy often finds me out there of a, an evening after work um, watering the, the plants and the vegetables. <laughs> I think sometimes she thinks I'm more you know, taken by the garden than spending time with her inside. <laughs> Matt and Daisy are happy to look at properties anywhere in and around Exmoor with good access to bridleways. I'm meeting up with them in the middle of the National Park to find out the finer details of the move. Welcome to Exmoor, guys, although this is a bit of a home from home for you, isn't it? You were born here. Right? Yes, so yeah, I was born in Barnstable, just up the road, and then got family over the moor. It's quite an unusual move because you've... Your mum and dad are coming, Matt. We need to find somewhere for them to live. But in terms of the house for you, what, what are you looking for? What's the, what's the dream parameters? Um, for us, we'd really like a sort of a detached property. We, are, at the moment, are in a terrace, so we'd really like some more space of our own, um, maybe with some land for a horse or two. How many acres are you looking for? Ideally, somewhere in the region of one to one and a half, um, sort of the minimum. What about the location? Are you looking to be the edge of a village or out in the sticks? We're quite easy, to be honest. We love the rural setting, um, and we love being in Exmoor, so that would be perfect. But at the same time, if it was in a village, then we're not worried. We're used to village atmosphere. And in terms of the style, are you looking for modern or old? Not a new build, although some are done very sympathetically. Uh, we understand that. So something with a bit of character. Obviously, you can get more for your money than in Buckinghamshire, which I think is one of the most expensive counties in the country. Yes. So your budget, tell me about your budget, because obviously we're combining a bit of money from your mum and dad. Correct. They're going to be there six months of the year, is that right? Ideally. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and they're going to be taking some of the equity out of their house, contributing it alongside ours, um, to hopefully get them, say, a nice little, uh, nice little property that they can come back to. So you're putting the lion's share in? Yes. Yeah. So what's our budget? What are we actually looking at? Uh, six to five is sort of our maximum. Well, it's a, it's a challenge. You've given us a challenge, I have to admit. Um, uh, but it's a beautiful area and there's some lovely properties and all of them have these amazing views. Mm. So um, let's get in the car and show you the first one. Excellent. Okay, Follow me. Combined with the capital from Matt's parents, Daisy and Matt have an overall budget of £625,000 to buy a detached character property. It should have at least three bedrooms as well as a self-contained annex, ideally in a separate dwelling, for Matt's parents to live in while they're in the UK. They also need a minimum of an acre of land for Daisy's horse and animals. I've got a great selection of rural properties to show them, with plenty of space for the family as well as the animals. But before revealing the price of each, I'll be asking them to take a guess. Our final property will be our mystery house, thrown into the mix to test where their priorities lie. So is this literally where you, you, did you come on childhood holidays here? Were you really familiar with the whole area? My summers were normally a couple of weeks at home and then spent a week with my nan in Wales, a week with my auntie in Woolacombe, <laughs> and then a week uh, sort of here. So is it atmospheric to come back? Does it feel like... Yeah, always, every time we came back, it felt like coming home. Our search begins in the North Devon hamlet of Charles, on the southwestern edge of Exmoor. Part of the parish of Brayford, the main village is just two miles away and has a great community feel with regular farmers markets and a number of events hosted at the village hall. The village got its name when the River Bray, which runs through its centre, was forded. This has since been replaced by a bridge, which is now an access point for the thousands of visitors to the National Park. Back in Charles, in a serene setting, I'm hoping our first property will appeal to Matt and Daisy. Come in, come in. This is your garden and potentially your house, house number one. Wow. Lovely. Yeah, I really yes, like it. Really nice. I love the, the cream sort of white exterior to it. Yeah, it's very quaint. Yes, it's very um, cute. definitely the, the style we're looking for. Is it? Yes, yeah, oh, very that's much. That's good. Yeah, it's a beautiful setting. Let's go and see inside. The original part of this property dates back to the mid-17th century, with the main living areas to the front. An extension to the rear has added a library area to the main living room, an office and a utility room with a back entrance leading to the kitchen. Come on in. Kitchen, the heart of the home. 
It's lovely. Really nice. Lovely room. Yeah, I really like it. Yes. I love the range. It's not a huge kitchen, but because it's knocked through into the kind of dining room, breakfast room, it feels much bigger than it perhaps is. No, I think it's functional. You've got plenty of workspace to do all your bits and bobs. <laughs> yeah. We'll go into the sitting room next. Lovely room here. Very cosy. Mind your head, Matt. <laughs> How tall are you? Six foot four. Six foot four, OK. Well, you can stand up inside. So this is the, the living space. You've got that extension at the back, uh, which was put on by the previous owner. It's a lot bigger than I thought it would be, actually. Much, yes. And then around yeah. the corner, there's actually a little office as well. Oh, perfect. Oh, perfect. That's what you need? Yes. Yeah. No, I love the fireplace as well. Yeah, it's beautiful. Great. So where would the Christmas tree go? That side or that side? <laughs> that's one for you to decide. Though. Oh, that means you've moved in when you make that decision. That's great. So no negatives so far? No. Not so far. It's cosy. Mm. Let's look upstairs. Matt and Daisy seem to be warming to this place. Upstairs, the extension has provided bathrooms for each of the three double bedrooms, two en suite and one as a family bathroom. They use this as the master bedroom. Well, this is the one you would use because it's got an ensuite and a walk-in wardrobe. It's big enough, especially head height-wise, for Matt, <laughs> but still doesn't feel, like, really big and it feels cosy. I love these character beams that add a bit more flavour to the property. Yeah, it ticks a lot of boxes yeah. from, from our side, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is a, another two people involved in it. <laughs> well, let's go and tackle that head on. Thanks. Perfect. Outside, Matt and Daisy would inherit some lovely plants in the beautiful garden, which has been well looked after by the current owner who runs a plant nursery. There's also a small annex on the site, which has a living room, kitchenette and bedroom in the converted loft. But my suggestion for housing Matt's parents would be the partially converted outbuildings on the other side of the garden. So just bear this bit in mind. It has a larger footprint than the existing annex, and is in a more secluded spot with its own garden area beside a pretty pond. Come up here, then you can survey your whole domain. <laughs> so it's a little bit complicated, but this is the property that you probably want to convert for your parents. OK. Um, it goes out quite a bit way on this side, and on the other side, they've already got... There's a studio and it's got electricity in it. So you'd obviously have to get pl planning permission yeah. to convert it. But this was actually a row of workers' cottages. So it's one of the part of the oldest bits of the, of the property. So I can't imagine it would be that difficult to get planning permission to convert. Yeah. It looks good size space, doesn't it? Very it good, looks... yes. You see the potential there. Yeah, I can see that yeah. suiting your parents really yes. well, actually. And you can see that this is all their garden, and it has a separate gate there. So this is, it would be a, you know, perfectly self-contained. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. We don't have to yeah. see them when we don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you think about the land aspect? Obviously, I don't think there's a room for, for the horse on here. <laughs> uh, but on the other side of the road, there is a three-and-a-half-acre paddock oh, wow. that belongs to the property, too. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get my horse on there. <laughs> <laughs> didn't expect that at no, all. No, I didn't. Seeing this, I thought, you know, this was... I mean, it's lovely size as it is. Yeah. But that's uh, definitely a massive bonus. Bonus, yeah. How much do you think this whole little bundle <laughs> of loveliness costs? I'm going to say 600. I'd go, to be cheeky, I think 590. Uh, well, I'm afraid you're both wrong. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this property is on the market for 525,000 pounds. Really? Wow. I wasn't expecting that to be No, fair. really wasn't. Go and poke around inside these outbuildings to see whether that's going to work and have a look at the, at the pastures new. Perfect. Thank you so Perfect. much. Thank you. For Cheers. Cheers. Explore. Oh, I feel like we've given them a wedding gift. It's so beautiful. And it could work. An amazing £100,000 under budget, this three-bedroom detached cottage would make a wonderful home for them and there's a substantial separate building for Matt's parents too, which could be developed subject to planning consents. The property comes with just over three acres of paddock and is right on the edge of Exmoor. Lovely space. Could fit a bedroom in here? Yes, you could definitely uh, see the potential in it. With our budget, we thought we would have to settle for an, an annex adjoined. So having that uh, separate property a little bit further away would be a benefit for both of us.
The main house is beautiful, really nice flow through the spaces. The land is perfect. There is plenty of room there for both Matt and I to have a horse. Definitely get some stables down there easily. You saw around this house, you saw around the other plots. Yeah, I think we've seen everything. Yeah, yeah. I think we've seen all we can. Is it a contender? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Should we not bother with the other ones? I think it'd be fun to see the others. <laughs> 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 Let's go. See it. Let's go. With over 400 miles of bridleways within its borders, Exmoor is a haven for horse riders. Its winding woodland trails and tumbling river valleys provide some of the best riding in the UK. Lucky visitors may catch a glimpse of the famous wild red deer or the native Exmoor ponies roaming freely on the moor. We've arranged for keen horse rider Daisy and Matt to visit a trekking centre near Linton to meet Charlie Wilson, who, six months ago, picked up the reins of the long-established business with the help of her partner, Chris Waring. Hi, Chris. Hi. <laughs> yeah, welcome to Brendan Manor. So is owning a riding school something that Charlie and you have always wanted to do? Probably more so Charlie's. I mean, Charlie's been into horses since, what, the age of six, seven years old. She's had her horse for 16 years, and she's taught me a lot, and I'm learning quite a lot, and, you know, so far, really, really enjoying the experience. One of the main aims of this move is to get some land and own some horses of our own. How difficult is it to look after your own horses? If I'm honest with you, it's going to take up a lot of your time. I mean, it's just almost like having children. They're a 24-7 thing, but the enjoyment you get out of them, they're absolutely fantastic. Once you've sort of got that link and that relationship, that friendship with them, they're going to be your companion for their lifetime. Building on the foundations of the existing business, Chris and Charlie offer a range of tours and treks for people of all ages and abilities throughout the year. In the peak season from Easter to late October, they have around 15 horses and ponies available to ride. And today they've set aside two of the more experienced ones for Matt and Daisy. So who do we have here then, Chris? We've got Sam. He's our old boy, 24 years old now. He's been at the centre for quite a few years. He's just that safe pair of hands that we need here, just to look after sort of the husband, the boyfriend, the friend who's sort of been brought along to ride. So how do you choose the particular horse for the rider? For instance, you, Matt, you know, we know you're a taller gentleman, so Sam would be absolutely ideal for you because you've not got a lot of experience. Some have got sort of a more zany side to them, I suppose. We have put the more experienced rider on those sorts of horses. So it sounds like Matt's going to be on Sam. So yeah. who's my horse going to be? Uh, well, I'll tell you what, we'll introduce you to Charlie, and she's going to be taking you out on the trek today. And she'll introduce you to your horse, Fudge. Perfect. It was Charlie's dream of turning a lifelong hobby into a career that brought her and Chris to Exmoor after falling in love with the landscape on a fun ride just 18 months ago. She's now in her element, spending six hours a day out on the moor. So, Charlie, I know this is uh, sort of my dream to be riding over Exmoor all the time. What's it like for you having a trekking centre here? It's absolutely amazing. The views are amazing, having all of this space. It's really the only way to ride. So how much are you allowed to ride over Exmoor? Is it completely open? Or? Yeah, most places are open. There are official bridleways in certain points. But yeah, most of it is open and you get to see the wild ponies. It's, it's amazing. It's pretty stunning scenery, isn't it? And this is just the start of it, really. And I'm assuming across in the distance is Wales. Yeah, that's right. So dead ahead is Wales. If you go to the right, that goes towards Minehead and Porlock, and to the left, that's Linton and Lynmouth. It's just a beautiful spot. Thank you so much for having us today, Charlie. Um, it's been spectacular. You're very welcome, and hopefully the house search will go well, and we'll see you here soon. With Daisy chomping at the bit to make the move down to Exmoor, it's back to the search to find her and Matt their home here. In a bid to get them as much space as possible, we're breaking away from the National Park border and heading to the small village of Meshaw. It's just a 10-minute drive to the larger village of Witheridge that centres on the parish church and has a couple of pubs, shops, a post office and a tea room. It's equidistant from Exmoor and Dartmoor National Parks and is conveniently positioned along the Two Moors Way, the 103-mile walking route that runs between them and the oldest regional footpath in Devon. The next house I want to show them is just over a mile from Meshaw. House number two. This is the annex, mm -hmm. okay. yep. which is co-joined with your neighbour, which is over the other side. 
Right, yeah. And then this is your house. I like it. Yeah, it looks a lot more traditional farmhouse. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a more modern property, mm -hmm. yeah. but, and it's more of a shared space. Yeah. Okay. So you the entrance. It's a nice drive, you know, nice drive down to it. Should we have a look at that? Sounds good. Excellent. This 18th century farmhouse is larger than our first property and would provide Matt and Daisy with growing room. The current owners have lived here for 20 years, and inside, it's very much a modern family home already. Come in, mind your head here. Into the kitchen. It's large. <laughs> yes, lovely size, isn't it? No, it's really nice space. Really, really big. Really like how it flows into the dining room. Mm. Yeah. And there is a utility room on the other side of the house, which looks sort of like a through boot room. So the dogs, you have dogs, or yeah. dog. <laughs> Bramble can just go straight through uh, without uh, getting the house dirty. What do you think of the vibe, though? Is it how does it compare to the last one? They're both really nice in different aspects. The style of it is a lot more modern, but still country. Let's go on into the sitting room. Mind step. Thank you. Come on through. They've obviously cut through to join all the space into one big one, but it mirrors the fantastic angle nook there, with a kind of little creamery on the side where they used to curdle the cream, and then over there, the bread oven. Oh, wow. This room's definitely got a bit more character than the kitchen itself. Yes, definitely. It's a really nice space, really big. Through there, you've got a small sort of study, sort of snug, and then through these double doors, you've got a sort of semi-hexagonal conservatory with doors out into the garden. Lots of light coming in there. Yeah. But let's look upstairs, because obviously yeah. the bedrooms are important. Upstairs, there are four double bedrooms of fairly equal sizes, with built-in storage, one with an ensuite, and a family bathroom. Nice big landing. Lots of space. And then this is the master bedroom. Probably about the same size, obviously more modern decor with a little ensuite through there. The doors are a little bit low. We can I'm sure we can change them, mm. make them a little bit higher. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I can definitely see that this has a, a really good space upstairs. I think you can probably get a bit more out of the house in, just in, in terms of longevity. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, the inside seems to be scoring highly. Let's see what happens when we go outside and look at all the options there. Perfect. We're done. Some positive feedback from Matt and Daisy, but I sense it all hangs on what's still to come, the living space for Matt's parents. Across the courtyard, there's a large barn, one end of which is currently used as a gym with a wet room. The other end houses a workshop with a loft area. If Matt and Daisy wanted to convert it to living quarters, they would need to get residential planning permission. But I want to show them the four and three quarter acres of land, which includes two paddocks and a large garden. Now, one thing this property does have a cracking field. It's really nice size, really big, really nice field. Easily separate this off into paddocks for the horses. Yeah, definitely. There's a nice lot of land here to work with. Yeah. It feels this property is a bit more kind of coherent in the sense you've got the land attached and uh, your parents will be sort of opposite, but, you know, a little bit separate. Uh, and do you think you could sort of make it work for your parents? Yeah, I think we could easily. Um, there's the scope to turn into a potentially nice little two-bedroom annex there. Yeah. Of course, you need money to do that. What do you think this big portion of land is and property is, is on the market for? I'm probably going to say 575. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go a bit lower. I was going to say 545. 545. OK, your skills are warming up. <laughs> it's on the market for £550,000. Yeah, that's a yeah, good price. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and definitely leaves that uh, money in the, the budget yeah. to. Uh, develop the, um, the outbuilding. Good, so there's a lot to look at in this property and I know we've been whizzing round, so take a stroll around and I'll collect you when you're done. Perfect. Brilliant, thank you. See you in a bit. This substantial character farmhouse has four bedrooms in the main property and the potential to create a separate two-bedroom annex in the existing outbuildings subject to the necessary consents. A plot approaching five acres gives Daisy plenty of space for keeping animals, and all this less than half an hour's drive from Exmoor. Yeah, really nice large space here. Yeah, make a lovely, like, kitchen diner. And then being able to break through to the existing barn there and turn it potentially into bedrooms. Bit of project? Yes, definitely. In terms of the house size, I definitely feel that it's something we can grow into. There's a lot of potential, a lot of scope here. The land is just superb. The location of this property isn't maybe as desirable as the first property. However, you wouldn't get as nice flat land as this in Exmoor, so there's a silver lining. 
You're surveying your, your kingdom? <laughs> yes. Good. Well, I'm going to have to uh, draw a close to this one. I know it's sort of tickled your fancy, but uh, time to draw a line under today and get ready for tomorrow. Yeah, I think we need a, a drink and some time to mull over today. That's always a good idea, isn't it, after house hunting? Yeah. I'm in the West Country with buyers Matt and Daisy from Buckinghamshire, who have set their sights on an outdoor life in Exmoor. For £625,000, they're looking for a character property with separate space for Matt's parents, who will be staying with them for half the year. They've already seen two great properties, but still to come, our mystery house offers a different perspective on multi-generational living. They had to put this fence here because the horses would come up and put their heads through the, through the windows. <laughs> I'd let them do that. I'd take the fence down. <laughs> and I find out about a local culinary delicacy that's making a comeback. It's shucking, right? I it's remember shucking. This. Yeah. this is quite an art. Oh, look at that. It's huge. Beautiful day here in Exmoor, the second day of our house hunting with lovely Matt and Daisy. And yesterday we did extremely well. Two bullseyes, really. So we could just kick back and relax, but we don't do that on this show. We've got a mystery house that is right slap bang in the middle of the Exmoor National Park, which is exactly what they wanted. But, and here's the but, they do have to share a roof with Matt's mum and dad. Our mystery house takes us to Brendan, a hamlet in the heart of the National Park. Surrounded by Exmoor's beautiful open moorland, it's just four miles from the dramatic North Devon coastline and the popular town of Linton. Being one of only three houses in the hamlet, our mystery property enjoys a peaceful rural setting with fantastic walking and riding directly on its doorstep. Now, we have brought you right into the middle of Exmoor National Park. How exciting. Yes. This is obviously a farmstead, and this is the property that we have to offer you. It's really nice. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Whoever's, somebody's looked after it really well. <laughs> it's a remarkable property. It's a remarkable spot. Of course, you know Exmoor. But, you know, this is dark sky heavens, no street lights. So at night you can see all the stars. And this property is interesting because it goes back to about 1850. It was a worker's cottage part of the kind of farmstead. The challenge is that you and your parents will be living under the same roof. Yeah. OK. That's something we had already considered. So it's not a massive shock and it's not definitely not a no. And it does come with some land as well, so... This is the little front garden, this would you know, probably be your garden. But there's potential to make another garden for, for Matt's parents and lots of land for the horses. Perfect. So I'll just go and see yeah. more. Let's look inside. The current owners have updated the property in the last five years and although it's ready to move into, it's currently used as a holiday let and perhaps lacks that homely feel meaning Matt and Daisy will need to use their imaginations. Come on inside. You can see what a high spec they've uh, done this uh, cottage yeah. up to. It's a fantastic quality. They uncovered this whole fireplace, put in the big double log burner. Uh, and then next door, actually, in the dining room, there's another log burner, so you'd be toasty oh, wow. warm. We'd be, we'd be hot. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of light coming in, which is really nice as well, from the window. Yeah, south-facing, all the windows, the garden south-facing. Yeah. Let's have a peek at the kitchen for you guys. Kitchen's a bit smaller than the other ones that we've shown you, but fantastic views out over the horse's paddock. <laughs> so you can watch your horses as you're washing up. It's nice because yeah. they had to put this the fence here because the horses would come up and put their heads through the, the, the windows. <laughs> I'd let them do that. Yeah, I'd take yeah. the fence down. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. I think it's functional all size, isn't it? Definitely, yeah. I mean, it's something we should sure we want to update, but you could definitely live in it for the time being. You've got four bedrooms, all really nice, very freshly decorated. I'm not going to show you them because I think more importantly is to show where Matt's mum and dad might want to go. So we'll go up to look at their bedroom. They were clearly excited by their location, but I'm not sure whether they're sold on our mystery house just yet. Although they'd be under the same roof as Matt's parents, there is the potential to separate the property, giving everyone their own space. At one end of the cottage, a recent two-storey side extension houses a large utility room and shower room on the ground floor and a bedroom upstairs. With its own entrance and staircase, this could easily be used as a self-contained annex. 
so we've come through an adjoining door from the other house. Yes. But of course they do, is a separate entrance, so you could close that up. Okay. And this is the bedroom of the kind of annex, as it were. And you could put a, there is a little shower and a, and a toilet here in upstairs, but mm -hmm. you could also put a little ensuite here. So this could be a whole self-contained upstairs. Yes, yeah, I mean, it would um, limit them to one bedroom. Yeah, there's no need space for one bedroom because you're in the Exmoor National Park, you can't really go up. Yes. I can see you're processing this all, but let's look downstairs because that'll make the puzzle make more sense. And we can also look where you can push out into the garden. Perfect. Although this space would need some work to make it a viable option for Matt's parents, the main house is ready to move into, with four good-sized double bedrooms for Daisy and Matt and their guests, and a large modern family bathroom. They could focus all their efforts on converting the annex. Come on in here. So as you can see, at this moment is, was the, a garage. They've turned it into a sort of sunroom with these, these doors. But what we were thinking is that, you know, you've got all the water here, but you could turn this maybe into kind of a kitchen sitting room diner and then put a conservatory out through there. They did mention that there's a scope for a conservatory. They would really like it. It's something mm. they've had in their last house. And Again, it would have to be with planning, but I think, that, you know, a conservatory is not such a big deal. It wouldn't be impinging on anyone's view. I think it's a good space. I think, yeah, adding the ensuite as well upstairs would make a big difference, wouldn't it? That would make a lot of difference to it. Yeah. yeah. Let's look outside and we can talk about sort of that aspect as well. Outside, there's a lovely lawned garden surrounded by a stone wall with direct access to five acres of pasture. Let me explain a bit about the land. Basically, this whole field is yours and actually goes up into a fair chunk of that woodland as well. Perfect. So what we were thinking is that if you took a... put a French door in there, brought the conservatory out right to the edge, you'd have quite a big kind of area of living room for your parents, subject to planning, of course. Yes. And then you could step down and make this their garden. Yes, very nice, good space. What do you think this big parcel of land and property is on the market for? Considering that the annex is attached, but then there is quite a bit of land, and we are on the Axwell National Park, so that does push the price up a bit. I'm going to go 525, five, the same as the first property. I'd probably put about 560. 560. So in this case, you're both wrong. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, this is in the other direction. This is actually on the market at 625. Oh, okay. right. Wow. Completely wrong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because the Exmoor National Park commands push... quite a premium. Yeah. yeah, it does push it up yeah. quite a lot. I guess I'm just being a bit hopeful. <laughs> I know there's a lot to think about, so why don't you nosy around inside? I'll see you out in the garden. Perfect. Thank you. This mystery house has four bedrooms in the main house and the potential to create a self-contained annex in the extension, with its own entrance and garden, subject to planning permission. It might be right at the top of Matt and Daisy's budget, but it is right in the middle of Exmoor National Park, and with five acres is the largest plot they've seen. Really good size space, isn't yeah. it? Get rid of the sink. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely views as well. Yeah, beautiful views. The location's absolutely perfect. Riding out on the moor would be not a problem. <laughs> and the land that comes with it as well, absolutely. Really good. Being in a national park is definitely uh, a benefit for Daisy and myself. However, the um, fact that the annex might not be ideal for the parents is really going to be a deciding factor in our move. Ah, all done with the mystery house. Yes, indeed. Yes, so we that's are. the lot. I've, we've showed you all the houses that we have up our sleeves. Mm -hmm. So let's find somewhere to sit, relax, and think through more. Perfect. Back in the 19th century, the Exmoor coastal village of Porlock was famed for its oysters. The opening of the railway from Minehead to London in the 1870s meant that oysters brought out of the sea during the day were on London restaurant tables that evening. Yet overfishing by trawlers led to the demise of these once teeming oyster beds, and by the turn of the 20th century, the industry had all but died away. Almost 120 years on, a local community initiative has reintroduced oysters back into the waters of Porlock Bay. I've come to meet Roger Hall to find out more about the project. What a lovely spot. I've never been to Porlock before. I'm delighted to be here. And I'm particularly delighted here because 
you are instrumental in kind of resuscitating oyster trade here. Didn't even know oysters grew in the Bristol Channel. Yes, well, apparently back in the 1800s, <laughs> it was quite a big business here. All was going well till the 1890s, when apparently all these boats from Colchester and Whitstable turned up, where we now know that uh, their oyster beds were nearly fished out. And they simply dredged all the oyster beds in the Bristol Channel out, destroyed all the seed oysters in the process, and that was the end of oyster fishing, until we came along a few years ago. In 2012, the Parish Council set up a scheme to encourage new projects and businesses of benefit to the local community, in line with its heritage. After a successful trial, oyster farming was brought back to Porlock Bay. Today, Roger and his co-director, David Salter, are waiting for the tide to go out to measure their latest batch of oysters. It looks like I'm just in time to join them. David. Hi, David. This is Alistair. Hi, Alistair. Alistair. David. Nice, nice to meet, meet you. you. my colleagues. So what's the actual kind of, like, logistics of kind of getting them out of the water? Because they're presumably... I don't know, do they grow like mussels? Do they attach to things? Different to a mussel, where the mussel grows a beard, the oyster is just in a big shell. So we put the oysters into big, heavy plastic sacks oh. and then strap them down onto metal trestles. So they're in the water and they're being fed, once they're under the water, all the waves and the nutrients are going over them. But then they expose them at certain times of the day. That's when we can work on them or harvest them. Mm. But that exposure actually toughens them up a bit, makes their meat a little bit thicker and stronger, so you get more muscle in it. It's a much chewier oyster, mm. more flavour. Nice. Although the oysters are just 300 metres away, the Seven Estuary has the second highest tidal range in the world at just over 12 metres, which helps to keep the water clean but makes access limited. Roger and David have just a few hours over two to four days twice a month to check and harvest the oysters. The tide is going out pretty fast, yeah, as you is. predicted. We should get so down we'll, there. Uh, should we go and have a run down there and you can see what we're talking about? We can about. go and taste nice. some oysters. Oh, have you got your thing? I've got the shucking knife. The shucking knife, knife. Yeah. that's it. I'm told that Porlock Bay oysters have the best classification for purity in England and Wales. This is the only Pacific oyster site with a Class A rating. Meaning, although Roger and David choose to put the oysters through a thorough purification process, they can legally be sold or eaten fresh from the sea. They look like some ghostly sun loungers. I know, <laughs> I know. That's right, yeah. It's covered in seaweed. <laughs> the sun loungers of past um, holidays. The Titanic <laughs> sun yeah. So what we do, every month we get down here take the bags off the trestles, shake the bags, turn them over, give them another shake. That takes a little bit of extra growth off the shell and you're putting more growth into the meat on the inside. Right, OK. Also, you clean the seaweed and any silt out and that allows the oyster to get more water in so it can feed. Each of these bags holds 250 oysters, so in total there are around 80,000 currently growing here in the bay. Each batch takes three years to grow. Give him a shake. And let's tip it up. And the te technical name for that is defrilling. Defrilling? Yeah. So how the, old are these ones? These oysters are about 18 months old. Oh, 18 months? Well, that's, that's not so old, right? No, no, no. So the, no. it's shucking, right? I it's remember shucking. This. <laughs> this is quite an art. Mm. With their first batch selling twice as fast as expected, Roger and David are well on their way to resurrecting this local industry. In five years' time, they plan to be growing and harvesting in excess of 300,000 oysters a year. Oh, look at that's huge!
nice oyster. We've been told that these are the tastiest oysters Wait, you, you can get. When you say we have been told, have you ever tasted one? I've tasted a cooked one. You've never tasted a raw one? I haven't yet, no. Are you going to taste one too, Roger? Yeah. Go okay. on. OK. Oh, they're beautiful-looking oysters. oysters. Oh, that's a good one too. Yeah, Roger, thank you very much. Okay, one, ready? two, ready three, here we go. Here we go. That is corking good. Oh, well, what do you think? I'm really impressed. Because I've never had it without vinegar no. or something like no, that. No, it's really nice, but just mm. to have them like that. Here's so. to Porluck, the home of the oyster. To Paul Luck. Oh, Thank you very much. With our tour of Exmoor drawing to a close, it's time to catch up with Matt and Daisy and find out if any of our three properties were to their taste. Look, we started by the river and we're finishing by the river. It's perfect. So it's been a great week. We showed you three nice houses. Have any of them jumped out at you? Yeah. yeah. I think <laughs> so. You have had uh, a wonderful week and um, seen those three spectacular properties. But to do feel that uh, property number one yeah. is probably... Uh, probably our leading lady yeah. at the moment. Oh, why is she the leading lady? I think it offers us everything we want, really. It's got the separate space for Matt's mum and dad, but at the same time, they're still close enough that we can all be together. Um, and also, it's got the land that we've always wanted as well. Paul and Linda... Your mum and dad became the sort of real deciding factor in the, in the hunt as we went through the week. Was, is that a fair comment? I think in a, in a way that is uh, is correct. Yes, um, they are a, obviously an important factor in the move, um, and it's a place that needs to suit both of us, um, not just Daisy and myself, but them also. And in terms of what happens next, I know your mum and dad have sold their house. Yes, so yep. they're ready to go. What what are the next few steps for you two? Go back for a second viewing, I think, probably, on the first property. Yeah, I'd definitely like to have a second look at that property with yeah. the parents. Yeah. They're going to come up this weekend oh, and great. Uh, come and look round with us and have a look of the area as well, because they don't know it too well, so it'd be nice to get them to fall in love with it as we have. I hope house number one works out. Keep us in the loop. Definitely. Yes. I've come down to the Lorna Dune Pack Horse Bridge, perhaps the most quintessential slice of Exmoor that we could fit inside your TV screen to finish off this lovely week down in North Devon and Somerset. And I think a great success. I think Matt and Daisy were pleased with the houses we showed them. And even though Matt's parents weren't here and that added a sort of mm, level of uncertainty, I think they're going to buy that first house. I hope they are, because it would be perfect for them. And I hope you enjoyed watching us and you'll come back for more next time on Escape to the Country. Matt and Daisy went back for a second viewing of Property One with Matt's parents, who saw the potential in the annex, but unfortunately felt it was one project too far. They're now taking a break from house hunting to go on honeymoon, but will be back exploring Exmoor on their return. If you'd like to escape to the country in England, Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland and would like our help, why not apply online at bbc.co.uk forward slash be on a show.